John Giesman will be next. John is um, a longtime friend. Um, he heard my call for a real attorney at the Public Utilities Commission. I've been doing these cases since the 1980s. I'm not a, a, an attorney, but there's a P in the PUC, and that's supposed to be for public, and so we should be able to participate. And we've done the best we can, but now we have an expert. So, John? Thank you, Rochelle. I wanted to uh, quickly give a summary update of where we are on our cases at the Public Utilities Commission and what's coming up with specific application to San Onofre. Uh, then I wanted to touch uh, briefly on the regulatory culture in California uh, and uh, reflect on why it's hard sometimes to, to make what would seem to be uh, rational or, or straightforward decisions in the regulatory sector. And then I wanted to, to end uh, with a brief uh, summary of some of the issues likely to come up uh, in the NRC's pending report on San Onofre Units 2 and 3. Uh, that's been in the press this week uh, in a way that I think is a bit provocative. Uh, and then I wanted to turn it over uh, to questions and answers because I think more than anything else would like to know what you're interested in and, and how we can uh, share our best advice or knowledge uh, on the subjects you're concerned with. With respect to our cases, uh, Rochelle mentioned the San Onofre case uh, for the seismic reviews is over. Uh, she characterized it uh, as a loss with respect to the, the peer review process. Uh, as an attorney, I'm trained to try to say, well, not a complete loss. Uh, and we will be uh, going back to the PUC quite shortly uh, with some demands uh, for them to explain how they expect to conduct that peer review process consistent with the State Open Meetings Act uh, and also consistent with the decisions uh, that the Commission rendered in the Seismic Studies case. Uh, there is some indication uh, on the part of Edison's consultants uh, that they may not be uh, prepared yet to go forward with the full three-dimensional studies which the decision ordered them uh, to do. And we're going to seek to have that clarified uh, this summer. We are also uh, recently joined in what the PUC calls its long-term procurement proceeding. Uh, I was asked to participate in a panel in Los Angeles about 10 days ago uh, talking about uh, what alternatives does Southern California have uh, now with the prospect that San Onofre will not be available this summer, which in large part is accepted as a given now by the, the state grid manager, uh, and may not be available uh, next summer or, or the summer beyond that, uh, or perhaps ever again. Uh, and the state agencies are, are slowly trying to come to grips with uh, planning for that contingency. Uh, that was a recommendation originally made to them in 2008 by the State Energy Commission, but the way state government works, there's a certain level of inertia and a certain level of amnesia. Nobody got around to addressing it uh, until San Onofre went down uh, at the end of January uh, this year. Uh, the PUC has initiated this long-term procurement proceeding, but to give you a, an example of how sometimes these processes seem as if they're designed to fail, uh, one of the early things announced by the PUC in its scoping memo for the proceeding was that the local reliability concerns of Southern California would be addressed in a different proceeding, uh, different courtroom, different calendar. In fact, they've already come out with a proposed decision on that. The bad news is the assumption in there was that San Onofre will be available 2013, uh, so they don't have any alternatives planned for it currently, although the grid manager, the ISO, has acknowledged that, well, in light of the last few months, maybe that's not a good assumption, so they want to reserve the right to change it, but the PUC will have already rendered a decision by the time the ISO decides whether or not to do that. Uh, the second bad aspect of this procurement proceeding is that with regard to 2014 
to 2021, the same assumption has been made. Uh, and the ISO has thought about changing its assumption in light of the experience of the last four months, uh, but it's already submitted its testimony, so it may not have time to do that consistent with the PUC rendering a, what the judge called a timely decision by the end of the year. Uh, what that in fact means, not that the state agencies are not going to address the problem, but that they are more likely than not to address it outside a public process uh, and more in a private emergency closed doors uh, meeting environment. Uh, and in that circumstance, our experience generally has been uh, that important public considerations don't receive uh, the weight that, at least in our view, they should. Uh, Rochelle mentioned the pg e seismic studies. Uh, the evidentiary record has closed on that. The briefs have been submitted. We're expecting the PUC to render a proposed decision uh, by the end of August. Uh, she mentioned the public nature of the peer review process there. Uh, it's pretty important when you're doing these peer review processes that they be transparent. Uh, our experience with the PG&E process turned up uh, what it would be hard to describe as anything other than shenanigans. Uh, the, uh, there's a fellow on the panel representing the county of San Luis Obispo uh, who, like Senator Blakeslee, happens to be a PhD in geophysics uh, and happens to have an oil industry uh, exploration and development background. Both he and Senator Blakeslee uh, are persuaded that a petroleum industry ship is likely to be much better equipped to look at the seismicity of a particular area, especially offshore, have much better tools, much better data analysis capabilities, probably a better trained crew. And if you're looking for a state-of-the-art assessment, would be the way that you'd want to go. It's a bipartisan group. Senator Blakes is a Republican. Uh, Dr. Gibson's a Democrat. But PG&E refused to turn over to the peer review panel any information about who they'd selected uh, when the peer review panel started requesting it in January. Uh, and now, PG&E had made this announcement publicly uh, in November that they'd selected a particular ship. So there was no secret that they were talking to a, a group at Columbia University. Uh, and, you know, there's a criticism that an academic environment, uh, not necessarily as well funded, not necessarily as well equipped, not necessarily as well staffed as people that get $100 plus a barrel to find oil. Uh, so, uh, the debate was fairly heated, PG&E refused to turn over the information, uh, and it became pretty clear over the course of the winter and then the spring that somebody was running out the clock. PG&E wants to get a permit for this ship uh, this summer from the State Lands Commission uh, and was determined that this peer review panel not stand in the way of doing that. Now I can tell you there's nothing particular magic about the information they refused to turn over. They turned it over to me. I had to sign a confidentiality agreement, but while they were stonewalling their independent peer review process, they allowed Rochelle, myself, David, all signing confidentiality agreements, meaning that we could tell you about it, but then you'd have to kill us. Uh, the pe peer review panel was deprived of the ability to, do, to, to get it in the uh, PUC proceeding. Uh, the lawyers interrupted my cross-examination of the PG&E technical specialists and said, you know, don't, don't blame this guy. This came straight from the law department, uh, which I guess was noble of them. But the fact remains that the peer review process had it not been public, would have never turned up this information. 
Uh, and Dr. Gibson from San Luis Obispo has resolved to take the question of the State Lands Commission. Uh, we'll have to see whether that makes any difference or not. But it does tend to reaffirm our belief that the Bagley Keene Act was written for a reason, that the public is, in fact, entitled to see public officials conduct their business in public. Uh, and it's our hope to bring uh, that same spotlight to bear on the Edison seismic review process as well. Also coming up, and with particular reference to uh, San Onofre, uh, the PUC August 2nd is supposed to adopt an order instituting investigation into what did they know, when did they know it, and who screwed up these steam generators. And that will be uh, the mother of all inquests uh, in terms of the growing concern about problems that very clearly should never have happened. Uh, now, I will say in terms of your local utility, you don't read this much, you absolutely never hear it. But way back when, six or seven or eight years ago, when Edison was originally proposing that they go forward with new steam generators to run out the remainder of the license and they figured there'd be about 10 or 12 years of remaining time on the license for these new steam generators. sdg &E said, we don't want any part of it. We don't think you need it to get to the end of the license. We're not certain that this is a project we want to continue to be associated. We shouldn't have our customers on the hook to pay for these things. Now, the PUC, presided over by a certain former president, Southern California Edison, slapped him back in the line, said, shut up, you're in the deal, don't bellyache. And who knows what else they got besides. But in any event, the customers here are now on the hook for your 20% share of somebody's screw up for a deal that you didn't want to be a part of in the first place. And frankly, I think that as customers in this territory, you ought to ask your utility, why don't you say anything about this? Are you going to let us get stuck with this bill that you didn't have anything to do with? I should say that uh, the uh, culpability is something that, that arguably comes up whenever you have a little bit of an oddball way of financing a capital improvement. Now this project, $671 million. Uh, as it was originally authorized. They later put a cap on it, $782 million. But it wasn't characterized as a capital expenditure. If that were the case, you know, the company, the shareholders would, would have to pay for it. And frankly, uh, if you believe in capitalism, even utility capitalism, you tend to think that managers are especially attentive when they're dealing with their shareholders' money. They're not, they don't stay managers very long. In this circumstance, it was characterized as an O&M expense. You know, the equipment, the old equipment was wearing out. In order to continue the operation of the plant, you need new equipment. Why don't we just treat it as an O&M cost and expense it directly to the customers? Let's not put the shareholders on the hook at all. What's O&M? Operations and maintenance. So that may have been a cheaper way of doing it. You know, they didn't have to pay a dividend on that. They didn't have to borrow money. They just take it from their customers. The downside of doing that is, again, this is a subjective view. Utility managers aren't all that careful when they're spending somebody else's money. And it's just human nature. They got more important things to worry about. And I think as this PUC inquest begins, it's going to be fairly clear that they weren't as careful as you would like to think you would be in dealing with your own money. Let me say a couple things about regulatory culture. Now, I don't know if any of you are geeks enough to have read the Japanese diet report that came out earlier this week. Uh, the Japanese Diet as Parliament uh, in Japan 
that responding to the public criticism of the closeness between the nuclear industry and the Japanese government regulators commissioned an independent report that would report not to the, the executive branch of government but directly back to the parliament about what went wrong. And the report really pulled no punches. Uh, it was pretty brutal in terms of there being a cultural problem between the alignment of interests over time between the regulator and the regulatee. And when Fukushima first happened, there's quite a bit written about that system. Uh, in Japan, they call it amakudari, A-M-A-K-U-D-A-R-I. This country would call it the revolving door. I think amakudari translates into something like descent from heaven. And the notion was that after these guys get finished being regulators, they go to work for the regulatees, uh, and they're all a lot better off financially as a result of that. What I am about to say, I want to emphasize, I say more as an anthropologist than I do as a muckraker. But in California, the last 10 or more years, we have a very, very similar system. Not necessarily a bad thing, although some, some of you may think that it is. But we rely very heavily on former senior executives from utilities to conduct our regulatory process. And some of those utilities rely on former regulators to become senior managers of utilities. There's an immense cross-fertilization. It's widely reported. I know the San Diego Press likes to, to keep repeating it. The, the president of the Public Utilities Commission is a former president of Southern California Edison. Okay, well, almost everybody in the energy field knows that. Not as many know that the chairman of the board, the California ISO, the grid manager that the handles the transmission system and announces whether we're going to have blackouts or not, is a former president of Southern California Edison. Almost nobody knows that one of the other five board members, the California ISO, Southern California Edison former pollster. I think most people in San Diego know that the president of San Diego Gas and Electric, former public utilities commissioner, not that many people know that the governor's chief of staff, former PG&E, senior executive, the head of the High Speed Rail Commission, you know the bullet train that's not going to come to San Diego? <laughs> former PG&E, senior executive. Actually, one of the best chairs we ever had at the California Energy Commission when I was there, former PG&E, senior executive. And under her leadership, the commission after I left, made very clear that the nuclear plants were a weak link. California's electric supply system, and we needed to develop a plan B. What would happen if they weren't available for an extended period of time? Nobody heeded it, but it's, I think, an indicator that it doesn't necessarily matter what background you come from. You can be an effective regulator, but our California Umakudari system puts an added burden on each of those that participate in it to emphasize transparency, a careful examination of each planning assumption that is made, and almost a superhuman effort to make certain that each of those key assumptions receive vigorous debate, public examination. The danger if you don't do that is this sense of we're all in this together, we all have the same interests. It's what I call, with no disrespect to the late Rodney King, but it's the can't we all just get along syndrome. And it buries important examination of critical public questions. And I think you'll see, as the PUC gets into this situation at San Onofre, that there was a lot of that going on. As people review, well, how did San Diego end up being on the hook for 20% of the cost of this, and yet at the very top of the list, 
of areas likely to be affected if we have blackouts? What has the so-called independent system operator been doing, planning new investments in the transmission grid that would allow all of Southern California to become dependent on a single 2,250 megawatt plant? That violates every single principle of prudent network planning imaginable. How does that stuff happen? Well, I think it comes from an unexamined, false sense of teamwork, collective identity, and a failure to adequately scrutinize the assumptions that we use. Let me say something about the upcoming NRC report, and I don't know if it'll come out tomorrow or early next week. There was a report in the UT a couple days ago that I think was, was let, me, let me say it kindly, misleading. Uh, in the sense that it emphasized almost with a sense of triumphalism. Well, all the problems were concentrated in one of the two steam generators in Unit 3. That's where the tubes failed. The NRC report came out five hours ago. Uh, that's a posting on the website. That's not the report itself. It's an updated posting from the posting that had been made about three days ago, and Rochelle and I were talking coming over here, not clear why this stuff is being dribbled out, uh, but the full report uh, is supposed to be imminent. And what's important about each of these postings, and what I would encourage you and, and any members of the media to really zero in on, get the tube count. Get the tube count steam generator by steam generator. There are four of them and find out in each of the four steam generators what's the level of degradation. And it would appear that the NRC is releasing things in a range 10 to 19 percent, 20 to 29 percent, 30 to 34 percent, and then 35 percent or greater. And the license requirement is that a tube be plugged at 35 percent. And what's important, I think, it's a little bit like you're driving a car. If you want to focus on your rear view mirror, then it's real important to know, well, which one of those four tires blew out? You know, you can see the pile of rubber over your right shoulder, so probably the right rear tire that suffered the tube failures. It doesn't tell you a lot about what's coming through the windshield at you. And I think if you look at each of the four tires, not just the one that blew out, and you assess the level of degradation in each of those four steam generators, you'll be in a situation to, to evaluate, as I'm sure the Edison company is doing right now, well, what's the likelihood we're going to get this thing fixed? And how are we going to fix it? And just because, let's say, well, the, the LA Times has published a figure that in Unit 2, 12% of the tubes are 10% degraded or more. Unit 3, 9% are. Just because a tube is only 10% degraded, Unit 2 is operated 22 months. Unit 3 is operated 11 months. What's that say about the future? How rapidly would that 10% degraded tube proceed to a 20% degradation or 30% degradation or beyond? I think that's likely to be the question that the NRC and ultimately the PUC is going to be asking. And as a guide, to what is likely to happen going forward. I think that question and how it is answered matters a lot more than where did most of the tubes blow up. You know, that you've already suffered the blowout. I think most of you that have ever gone to the tire store realize that when that happens and they say, well, you got 9% tread wear over here and 12% tread wear over there, 
they tell you better replace all four. Yeah. <laughs> and frankly, if there's not a repair option, and I don't know how you repair a situation that appears to have been caused by poor computer modeling that overestimated, or rather underestimated, the hydraulic flow rate by magnitudes of 300 to 400 percent. I don't know. I mean, you probably come up with hypothetical ways to repair that, but I don't know how you test it to a level of assurance that will satisfy your regulator. So if you're not talking about repair, you're talking about replacement. And well, I myself doubt the government will ever say, now, nah, don't replace that, that's stupid. The company might. Now, Ted Craver is not a stupid guy. Uh, and his duty to his shareholders, I think, is first and foremost in his mind. And he is not going to leap over a financial cliff that he's not completely assured that he'll be able to recover all of the money from his customers. And Rochelle the Alliance for Nuclear Responsibility and what, I little, what little I can do to help them will make certain that he's never able to do that.